First, you'll have to find one. It could be the guy with the George Bush 43 photo on his desk in accounting. Or the crazy uncle you stopped speaking to since a Thanksgiving dinner 17 years ago, involving a fight about whether Ronald Wilson Reagan was a greater president than JFK. But you will need to find one. And you should be within 10 years of each other in age, and your income should be within $100,000 a year of each other, if possible. And your IQ should be not more than 10 points higher than his or hers. And I know you're thinking that's going to be a tough find. And you need to reach out to the Republican, and when you ask them to lunch, be honest. Tell them you have not had a serious conversation with a Republican in more than 10 years. Tell them you never ever glance at Fox News. Tell them you wouldn't be caught dead listening to Rush Limbaugh. Tell them you think Republicans are behind the times and that they're closet racist, homophobic, sexist, and warmongers. But then tell them that you saw this play about a guy with a Walter Mitty fantasy of becoming Charlie Rose. And you're starting to feel guilty about Republicans. Tell them you long hoped that Palestinians and Jews could bridge their differences. And so you're feeling somewhat hypocritical for not seeking some type of common ground with Republicans. When you meet the Republican for lunch, here are the ground rules. Agree that you are not going to talk about the weather, or the kids, or the little woman, or the wandering eyes of your husband, or your wife's pending menopause, or the Cubs or the Yankees, but are going to talk about a political topic of some breadth and depth in currency. For example, the war in Afghanistan. Keeping the economy on track. Gay marriage. Women in combat. Or, better yet, how about you tee up this quote from David Foster Wallace. 95% of political commentary, whether spoken or written, is now polluted by the very politics it's supposed to be about. Meaning, it's all become totally ideological and reductive. The speaker slash writer has certain political convictions and affiliations, and then proceeds to filter all reality and, and present all assertions according to those convictions and loyalties. Everyone's exasperated and pissed off and impervious to argument from any other side. Opposing viewpoints aren't just incorrect, but they're contemptible, corrupt, evil. Conservative thinkers are balder about this kind of attitude. Limbaugh, Hannity, that horrific O'Reilly person, Coulter, Crystal, etc. But the left's been infected too. Have you read this new Al Franken book? Parts of it are funny, but it's totally venomous. Like, what possible response can writers' pundits have to Franken's broadsides other than further rage and return venom. Or see also E.G. Lapham's latest Harper's columns. Or most of what's in The Nation, or even The Rolling Stone. It's all become like Zinn and Chomsky, except without the immense bodies of hard data these older guys use to back up their screeds. There's no more messy, complex, community-wide argument or dialogue. Everything is relentlessly black and whitened. Since the truth is far, far more gray and complicated than any one ideology can capture, the whole thing seems to me not just stupid, but stupefying. Watching O'Reilly versus Franken is watching blood sport. How can any of this possibly help me, the average citizen, to deliberate over whom to choose to decide my country's macroeconomic policy? Or how to even conceive of the chances of North Korea nuking the DMZ and pulling us into a ghastly civil war? Or how to balance domestic security concerns with civil liberties. Questions like these are all massively complicated. And much of the complication is not sexy. So, most of the political commentary, meanwhile, simply abets the uncomplicatedly sexy delusion that one side is right and just, and the other wrong and dangerous. Which is, of course, a pleasant delusion, as is the belief that every last person you're in conflict with is an asshole. But it's childish and unconducive to hard thought, compromise, give and take, and the ability of adults to function as any kind of community. Now, that's a long quote, but a good one in my estimation. It first appeared in the November 2003 issue of The Believer. Wallace gave us a lot to ponder. I suggest that the two of you luncheon companions, the Democrat and the Republican, take a shot and try wrapping your arms around well, Wallace's observations. And consider what you might have done to make him feel better about this discordant state we are all in. And I know, I know, in less than five minutes, you will either expose the utter foolishness of the Republicans' positions on the topic presented, 
or reach a point where you agree to disagree. But don't stop there. Both of you need to go further. You need to step back and start over. Go to first principles. And try to find out why it is that you've chosen to go down different paths in analyzing political views. Talk about your parents' political inclinations. Talk about Locke and Hume and the Roosevelts, all of them, Teddy, Franklin, and Eleanor. Talk about whether you were part of the cool crowd in high school or whether you're a loser and how such a posture may be playing out in shaping your political views. Find a means to escape the blind alleys of current political discourse and see if there's any way to forge a joint view toward addressing issues. Above all, during the luncheon, listen. Really listen for understanding. Be kind. Be loving. Grow. And pick up the tab. The data's out there. Liberals aren't nearly as good as conservatives at picking up the tab. And go home that night, and over dinner, tell your spouse, your significant other, or a good friend about breaking bread with a Republican. Describe your luncheon in detail. See how long the two of you can go in describing the luncheon without making fun of your luncheon companion. You have until February 28th to make the date. Go in peace, my friends.